Hi, I'm Scott Bradley. When I was in third grade, I was cast as a piano player in my school play. Now, back then, I knew how to play exactly one song. So my role was essentially playing that song over and over and over again. So around the sixth or seventh rendition, I decided to have a little fun and try a little amp rub. So I stopped, I turned to the audience, and I said, any requests? So there were no requests that day, but I was not discouraged. And a few years later, I heard New Orleans jazz for the first time. And now as I heard all the horns improvising melodies around each other, it made me think of like a bunch of old friends just having a really lively conversation. Now, I didn't really know much about what jazz was at this time, but that didn't really matter to me. I knew that this music had this amazing communal aspect to it that I couldn't find anywhere else. And I knew that it was a conversation that I wanted to join. So fast forward to 2006. I had spent the last decade refining my craft as a jazz pianist and I was ready to move to New York City, the music capital of the world. So I was about to get discovered, right? Wrong. Unfortunately for me, it was the music capital of the world because everyone was a musician. I soon received an unsolicited education about the harsh realities of life as a musician. The city was full of great jazz musicians, and there just simply wasn't enough work to go around. And when I did have a gig, I was treated largely as background music, or at best, a museum piece from a bygone era. The general public couldn't find any relevance in the type of music I was playing, and I couldn't say that I blamed them. I realized that I had to make a choice, either accept this and relegate music to a side hobby and find a real job, or find a way to get people excited about my music. Now, I always had a long-standing fascination with the idea of performing concerts in venues that were never intended to host music. When I was in middle school, I brought a trumpet into science class and got detention. When I was in high school, I had a band where we only played at convenience stores, at gas stations, in the middle of the night. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what it sounds like. I even got fired from my first job at Walmart for bringing a band to play at the paint counter. And yes, I also lost my 10% discount card as a result of that. So it was crazy. But so clearly, this fascination had a bit of uh, pathological tendencies at times. But this time, it led me to a venue that not only tolerated my unconventional performances, but also found a way for the whole audience to take part in them. Back in 2006, I decided to have some fun one day, and as an experiment, I recorded myself playing a medley of 80 songs done in the style of ragtime. And I'll show you what that sounds like. So forth, you know. For those of you keeping score, that was, thank you. Oh, here we go. Shh, shh, I'm still talking, I'm still talking. <laughs> that was Careless Whisper as Ragtime. So I uploaded this video to YouTube, and within a week, over 60,000 people had watched my performance. More people than had ever seen me play in all the years of my life combined. And not only that, but people actually like, talked about it. And this being the internet, some comments are more constructive than others, but that's okay. This was the first time that I had found a platform where I could post my musical experiments and have musicians and non-musicians alike join the conversation. So I soon immersed myself in the world of social media. And before long, it was profoundly influencing my music. I started using news items as a basis for musical experiments. When I heard that irate residents of Detroit had petitioned against plans to have the band Nickelback play at a halftime show, I decided to split the difference and offer a compromise by arranging a Nickelback song in the style of Motown. Today, a Motown tribute to Nickelback, and that is a real name, that's the name of the band and also the description of it. <laughs> we have a CD and we have played at a major Canadian festival. So now all of this, this is all well and good, but I couldn't think, help to think back to my beloved New Orleans jazz. That's what got me on this path in the first place. How could I share the conversation of improvised music with my online audience? How could I draw inspiration from them in a live setting? 
How can I make them feel like they're in the same room as me, not just listening, but actively contributing? One day, I was playing a restaurant gig, and I decided to stream it over the internet. Unbeknownst to all the diners that night, I was actually taking requests of people all over the world, some thousands of miles away. That was the first time I've ever played a mashup of George Gershwin and Rihanna, for instance. <laughs> so my mind raced with the possibilities that this technology held for musicians like me. I realized that I had found a way to turn my background music performances into social media events. Emote Control is a website, it's an online performance space that allows and invites the audience to literally engage in conversation with the performers and influence performances all in real time. By utilizing streaming video technology and social media interactivity, I was able to create a space where viewers could connect with performers, share ideas, and create content just instantaneously. So what that means for me as an improvising musician is that I now have a way to draw on the whole creative energy of a live audience from the comfort of my New York City apartment or from, say, the stage at TEDx Orange Coast. Let's put the website up right there. So what do you guys want to hear? I'm here on the stage. Bohemian Rhapsody? Oh, that's a good one. Wait, what a wonderful world. I, I love that song, but maybe we'll match it up with Bohemian Rhapsody. It sounds like this. Thank you all for being a great audience.